Greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line. My name is James White. Got a lot to get to today. Um, I don't know even where to start. I suppose it would be good to make sure you know what's going on in just a couple of weeks. I've heard people are actually going to be traveling to uh, attend everything we've got going on uh, up in um, uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, so uh, make sure everybody knows what's going on on uh, Thursday. Let me uh, get this thing back down to its right size there. On, um, let's see, this would be Thursday, October 3rd. Um, and if you if you find the Orthodox Presbyterian Church page, uh, Jason Walls up in Salt Lake, you'll be able to get all this stuff. But on the 3rd is when uh, Jeff Durbin and I are doing the debate on atheism with two atheists from the uh, Utah Atheists. On the 4th is my dialogue, What is Truth, with Alma Allred. The 5th is the general conference in the morning. And then in the evening, we just announced this uh, at Christ Presbyterian Church, which is 8630 West Magna Main Street. Um, it's on the west side of, uh, of Salt Lake City, out there toward where all the, uh, the mines are. Um, I'm going to be doing a debate with Lee Baker. The New Testament has been decept has the New Testament been deceptively changed and is untrustworthy. So if you remember last week, I think it was exactly a week ago today, is when I went through the 15 points that Lee Baker had had posted, and I went, nope, none of this is true, and here's why. And so Jason Wallace came up with the idea, hey. What do you think? And and so I said, nah, he'd never do that. Well, he 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 will. So uh, that is on Saturday evening and Sunday morning, Sunday school and Sunday morning service. I'll be preaching. So this is not a um, a vacation uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Wouldn't have been one way or the other. But this is gonna be a crazy crazy time. And then I fly back on Sunday and Tuesday. I head for Australia. So one day in between. Uh, it's. Um, going to be absolutely insane. We're going to, uh, Abdullah Kunda and I are going to be doing a debate in Australia on th Thursday the 17th, I think, in Sydney. Um, finally found a Muslim who would be willing to debate uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, a true follower of Jesus, um, or an innovator. Because uh, obviously, from any Islamic perspective, you you have to take that perspective. You can't what are you, you going to do? What are you going to say? Um, uh, the author of the Quran clearly knows nothing of the New Testament, knows nothing of Paul's writings, and contradicts those writings fundamentally. All the New Testament writings, but especially the Pauline letters, are the real obvious ones. So anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, I think I get back uh, from, uh, let's see... Why won't this scroll? I don't know why it won't scroll. There we go. I guess I have to use the touchpad for some reason. Um, let me see. I think I get back uh, two days before uh, RefCon, <laughs> ReformCon. And um, so, yeah, and that's uh, looks like it'll be uh, one right at two weeks prior to leaving for London. So I've said, once this trip starts, the end of September, I'm going to wake up the next day, and it's going to be Christmas. So that's just sort of how uh, this is going to go. So uh, that will be on um, Saturday, October 5th. It will be the debate with uh, with Lee Baker. So for those of you all excited about that, I'm, I'm excited to be able to provide answers to bad arguments, but that, that's what they are. They're just bad arguments. They're not based upon any serious interaction with meaningful Christian scholarship as far as the textual history of the Bible or theology or any of those things. So uh, we will do the best that we can do and hope that the Lord uh, blesses uh, from that, uh, that point. So there is that. Um, Real quickly, I saw uh, some of you have been seeing the uh, tweets from the Wheaton professor, Esau McCauley, 
And this one started things. A question that I can't stop asking, if all translation is interpretation. Stop, it's not. All translation involves interpretation, but putting an equal sign there, which is what is is, is the foundation of this problem. That's that's not true. But if all translation is interpretation, and interpretation is influenced by social location, stop. Interpretation can be, and to an extent may be, but not all interpretation is interpreted by social location. So we've got two problems already. This is your standard critical theory style of approach. Um, What does it mean that most of our English Bibles were translated with very few black or other Christians of color or women involved? Um, So here's your intersectionality coming in, and here's your critical theory coming in. Uh, Wheaton's infected by almost there. You can, you can pretty much put on two hands, the number of Christian colleges and universities today that are not in fact, uh, deeply influenced by critical theory and intersectionality, everything that goes along with it today. Uh, but, uh, but here you have it very plainly at, uh, at Wheaton. Uh, I responded, uh, to this. I, did not get any responses to my knowledge uh, to what I what I wrote, um, but um, it has no more impact uh, upon the translation of the Bible than the fact that there were no women involved in writing the Bible either. <laughs> um, so, pfft, who cares? Um, uh, the, the fact is there were no pasty white Europeans involved in writing the Bible either. Um, and so all of this identity politics standpoint of epistemology is foolishness, foolishness, foolishness. It needs to be seen for what it is. Christians need to stop playing footsie with this just because, just because they want to be seen to be wise in the world. There's no difference between this, the foolishness of this and Darwinian uh, evolutionary theory. And a lot of you have given into that too. So, hey, you know, Christians just want to be, just want to be loved by everybody. And uh, there's, there's lots of people that are willing to buy into this foolishness, but it is that. It's just simply foolishness. Um, what does it mean that most of our English Bibles translated with very few black or other Christians of color women involved? Absolutely positively nothing. Absolutely positively nothing. And uh, then he had a later tweet where he was asking, you know, what should, uh, what should Bible... What should future Bible translation committees look like, and how should they strive for inclusivity and all the rest of this type of stuff? And my response was they should, first of all, we don't need any English translations, period. We've got all that we could possibly need. Um, the major translations that are still functional and worthwhile have still have functioning translation committees, and uh, those translation committees should be well-stocked by people who are experts in translating the foreign languages into English. Doesn't matter what their grandpa or their great grandpa was, doesn't matter what their gender is, it's irrelevant. Completely, totally, 1000% irrelevant. And I'm not going to play the game of trying to. Oh, hey, by the way, did, did we get the um, uh, teleprompter working? Is the, you know, because I'm, you know, because I, because I can only, I can only say what I'm told to say. So I just want to make sure that that I, is this is this old stuff that we're doing here or you know cuz <laughs> Yeah, put that microphone down, dude. You get get I already got us in enough trouble. Um <laughs> Sorry, but <clears throat> that's just that was <clears throat> We we didn't get our notes today, man. Yeah, we did. I didn't get the show notes. So I don't know what to talk about. I'm I'm I I, I have no original thoughts of my own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway. So, anyhow, yeah, those were the... Um, they've got Esau McCauley at, uh, at Wheaton, and um, uh, it's, uh, it's sad. Uh, next, uh, <clears throat> I am going to get to the uh, Drew Brees stuff, don't worry. I, I, I'm just getting the other stuff that I had thrown into the... You know, Rush talks about his pile, uh, and uh, so I have... I have a couple things. In fact, I didn't even fire up. I, I suppose I should. Wow, I, I, I'll probably fire this up and go. Oh, that's what I was going to talk about. But uh, I, I do. I do a couple things. I do. Um, I I do. Uh, yeah. Okay. Funny, first first thing up was another thing from Esau McCauley. Um, same uh, same fellow. But um, I use uh, Evernote. 
so when I'm reading stuff online, I can just pop it into into Evernote and and uh, and there it is. And uh, then I I do screenshots and throw them into Dropbox. And that's what I'm looking at now are screenshots from Facebook and stuff like that. Um, and that's basically I don't have as much as some people would like to pretend that they are. Um, I don't have people writing stuff up for me. I don't have people doing show notes. Uh, Rich doesn't, you know, Rich does his thing and he just comes in and finds out what I'm going to talk about. Uh, when I start talking about it, um, it's me, myself and I, and yeah, there's a couple folks on Twitter and Facebook that will drop links that are, uh, that are interesting and useful and stuff like that. But that's about all there is to it. Uh, I'm sure I'd have a wider range of things. Like, you know, uh, I am going to tie in what uh, Dr. Moeller was talking about this morning with the uh, uh, <sighs> whole issue of homosexuality and drag queens and kids as drag queens and the, the insanity of our, of our society, or the evil insanity of our society. Uh, and so there's stuff like that. But um, no, we don't have uh, any teleprompters. And uh, anyone who thinks uh, that they are writing my stuff for me, they're delusional. <laughs> but <clears throat> we've known that for a while now. Anyway, um, Bassam Zawadi is a uh, Muslim apologist. I debated him once. I'd like to see if that we could do that again. Uh, or if not debate, we could have some dialogues. Um uh, I mentioned last last time I mentioned something from Bassam was uh, just last week, and I said, you know, it's it's weird. I'll, I'll be sitting there reading Bassam stuff, and when it comes to a lot of things, it's it's just like when I read Patrick Madrid stuff. We're, we we see the same problems, and we're stunned by the same stupidity taking place in society, and then when you get to the solution, all of a sudden. The, the, the paths depart uh, because he's a Muslim and I'm a Christian or uh, Patrick Madrid's a Roman Catholic and I'm not and uh, uh, reject that as a fundamentally flawed uh, system of religion. But, um, uh, but it is interesting to and helpful to understand how other people think and to interact with them along those lines. So sometime last week, um, Bassam got on a roll when it came to, I don't know if he was watching some stuff in preparation for um, something on the subject of the resurrection or crucifixion or whatever it might be. But uh, this one especially caught my attention, and so let me read it to you. When Christian apologists like Michael Lycona debate the alleged... Well, wait a minute. There is a... This one came first in my reading. I want to start with the one that came first, the reading. I'm not sure if it's the same... Uh, yeah, no, this one actually came first chronologically. Back up. Today, I listened to Christian apologist Michael Lycona say, quote, I don't like reading the Old Testament. And I wrote to him, and I got the link, and um, that's exactly what he said. Um, I, you know, I wanted to know what the, what the context of that of that was, and that was exactly what he had said. Um, and so, because I was like, you know, what's the, there could be a lot of things that would raise that kind of assertion or thing like that. But um, oh man, I, I got to remember to wonder if there's a way I can mark that because there, there's a I saw something else I was going, oh, I've got to talk about that, uh, and I'll just never remember with everything else that I've got here, but um. He did say that, and uh, he says, you know, I, I don't, I don't like to write, read the Old Testament, and it's all within that same area of discussion of where we're talking about um, the issue of doubts and uh, and his his argument that uh, as long as the resurrection is true, then everything else is you know just simply goes along with it. So here here's what he, he had said. Lycona said, I have a lot of unanswered questions. There are things that bother me. They worry me. I think one thing I've learned, I learned this from Gary Habermas, a mentor of mine. I would come to him and I'd say, what about this and what about this? And he'd say, did Jesus rise from the dead? Yeah, okay, well, 
Why is that bothering you? Yeah, but there's debate today among scholars. Who wrote Matthew? Did Matthew actually write the Gospel of Matthew? Well, Mike, did Jesus rise from the dead? Yeah, well, if Matthew didn't write Matthew, would Christianity still be true if Jesus rose from the dead? Yeah. Well, then, why is it bothering you so much? Bart Ehrman. We've had five debates, he and I. Uh, he would point out all these different contradictions and errors in the Bible, and I'd say, well, I don't grant those to you, Bart, but look, if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true, even if it were to be the case that some things in the Bible aren't. And he agreed. Well, what's the big deal, then? That's the response that, it, that's the response that has provoked for me. So, yes, I have a lot of unanswered questions. Yes, there are some things in the Bible that trouble me, honestly. I don't like to read the Old Testament, but I've learned to put things into perspective. If Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true, period. That helps me keep the main thing the main thing. So I don't worry about a lot of those things anymore. They don't bother, really bother me nearly as much because it's all in perspective. Now, I've studied the historical evidence of the resurrection of Jesus, and I'm thoroughly convinced that it happened, so these other things just don't bother me. Okay, we've all heard this. We've, we've gone over this over and over again. We've pointed out the incoherence of this position. It is an incoherent position. Um, to, on the one hand, throw the Old Testament out, and then on the other hand, say, Jesus rose from the dead. But I can't tell you what that means. It's Even though it was prophesied, that's all in the Old Testament. I don't like the Old Testament. To, to shred the fabric of the faith in this way is incoherent. And we have said this. We have, we have demonstrated it. We've talked about it. Um, it's the same thing that comes up with, of, of course, with Andy Stanley and unhooking the Old Testament and all the rest of this kind of stuff. So here is a Muslim. He says, today I listen to Christian apologist Michael Icona say, I don't like reading the Old Testament. I've heard other Christian apologists saying things like that they find many parts of the Old Testament to be disturbing. I mean, Seriously? What kind of reverence for God's Word do you display when you speak like that? Why on earth do you even believe in it, if, it, if that's your attitude toward it? The way some Christian apologists speak about their Bible makes you wonder why non-Christians are supposed to think any better of their scriptures. Yeah, where's the mic to drop? When, when the other side gets it, hears it, and goes... Y- y'all, aren't, y'all aren't seeing this? Now, Bassam knows that we've seen it and that we've pointed it out, and he's aware of that. But it is troubling that there are so many Christians that don't see it and this, just close a blind eye to it uh, or even agree. Well, yeah, that's, 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 that's a nice way to go. It's, it helps to get around this, that, or the other thing. It doesn't help to get around anything. Um. Why should Muslims come to accept? Well, again, those folks are incrementalists. They are, you know, let's, let's get them to believe in the resurrection, and then you can start working on the nature of God, and, you know, eventually we can get around to Scripture. It, it may be many years down the road. Now, I'm not sure how you're supposed to do all that other stuff without Scripture. It's all part of divine revelation, It makes no sense to me whatsoever, and it doesn't make sense to a lot of other folks, and that includes folks on the other side of of the um, of the battle lines. Uh, They see it and go, "What are you all talking about? That doesn't make any sense." Um, Then the other thing he said was, when Christian apologists like Michael Icona debate the alleged resurrection of Christ, they prevent their opponents from advancing any theological and philosophical objections and try to restrict the debate to the domain of history. For them, Christ's alleged resurrection is only a historical question. Okay. Well, it is a historical question, um, but it is a historical question that is presented by the Christian scriptures in the midst of a tremendous amount of theology, prophecy, atonement, uh, redemption, uh, the kingdom, uh, all these things. It's not just a historical reality. And I would say that, for example, I think the year after Bassam and I debated, uh, I think it was the year after, or maybe before, but I think it was the year after, we did a debate in the same church on, not, not Bassam and I, but uh, Sammy Zathody and I did a debate on the crucifixion, and Sammy turned it into a debate on the resurrection. He had to, because um, I, I would suggest to Bassam, the historical realm for the Muslim is extremely troubling, because the Quran puts you with 40 Arabic words, with no commentary from the Hadith, puts you in a situation where 
you're having to defend the in- indefensible. You really are. Um, but I get what you're saying is that these folks do turn it into um, an event that has to be evaluated differently than the apostles evaluated it and proclaimed it. Because the apostles proclaimed it, this is what Moses and the prophets said was going to happen. This demonstrates that Jesus truly was who he claimed to be. He is the one who's founded his kingdom. Bow the knee. They didn't. They never argued. Well, you know, the greater probability of the preponderance of the evidence <laughs> is that it's more likely that Jesus rose from the dead. We're not saying that that means anything about who he was. That's a different issue. And, you know, not gonna really going to look at, you know, what the Gospels say. And, nah, I, I get it. Uh, you know, I, I agree. Um, but uh, <clears throat> it still doesn't excuse the Muslim who will try to raise solely theological objections to the resurrection and just not deal with the historical reality of the Quran, you're, you're, if you're going to criticize, for example, if you're going to use argumentation against the New Testament, against the Synoptic Gospels, for example, and do what Shabir always does and what Yusuf always does, and that is argue that there is this evolutionary development from Mark to Matthew, from Mark to Luke to Matthew, et cetera, et cetera. Then you've got to recognize that you are putting forth an entire corpus of words of Jesus in the Quran that have zero, zero historical uh, pedigree to them before the Quran comes into existence. And even if you put that in 632, you're still talking over half a millennium after the time of Jesus. And so you're, you're, you're operating on two completely different planes. Even if you take later dates, not radically later dates, but later dates for the Gospels, put them after AD 70 or something like that, um, you're still dealing with first century documents versus uh, six and, well, seventh century documents even going with the Muslim understanding of when the Quran as a corpus comes into existence. So, let's, let's, we've got it. Those are some of the things that need to be discussed. Um, he goes on to say, with all due respect to Lycona and others, they simply have no right to do so. History is not the only epistemic tool at our disposal here. If a strong theological argument could be leveled against the doctrine of resurrection, well, then it must be addressed. History, by Lycona's admission, only serves to proffer speculative knowledge at best. Side note, we Muslims would be more nuanced when making such a claim. Thus, if one could offer a theological or philosophical argument which offers definitive knowledge, then that should take epistemic precedence over speculative knowledge. This is regardless of the epistemic tool used. For what truly counts at the end of the day is the reliability of the outputted knowledge itself. Hence, a Muslim who has definitive philosophical and theological reasons for rejecting Christianity is well within bounds of reason to dismiss from the get-go any speculative historical arguments advanced for Christ's alleged resurrection. Well, I, I, I doubt that Lycona would accept the idea of that all he's presenting is a speculative historical argument. And I really wonder that you know, for major portions, major portions of the early Islamic narrative, um, wouldn't you have speculative historical arguments for a large portion of it? Um, I, I get what you're saying, and I believe that the historical arguments and the prophetic argument and the theological argument all weave together to make one very, very strong argument for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the well, crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, but, you know, so I would, I would offer a different perspective, but I also understand that there is a correct recognition that when Christians try to artificially limit the range so as to minimize the areas that they have to deal with, that that's inappropriate. Uh, and I've, again, been saying that for a very, very, very long time. One more thing. Um, 
Oh, oh, well, okay, two more things. Um, during this uh, conversation, this uh, reasonable faith apologetics panel, um, Lycona said to, because it was with William Lane Craig and Mark Middleberg, here's something Lycona said, hey, Bill, I had an idea I'd like to run past you and see what you think. Of course, there's no perfect illustration, but let's suppose that I video record the Super Bowl and I know the end result. Now, when I go back and I watch the Super Bowl, each of the players had complete free will in what they were doing, and the coach, all right, let's punt it rather than going for the field goal for the Falcons at the end. Bill and I both live in the Atlanta area, so he knows what I'm talking about, so I know what they're going to do, but they had total free will in the process to make that. But I knew before I watched it on the DVR, I knew what they were going to do. So just having foreknowledge of what they're going to do doesn't impact the fact they had free will. Now, now we've all heard this one before. This is nothing new. Uh, this is not some groundbreaking concept. Um, and Craig's response is, I think that's right, Mike. Knowledge isn't a causal factor in this, is it? Both of them, on a theological level, just face-planted. I mean, that's the only way I can put it. This is face-plantingly bad. Why? Because they just drew a direct parallel between God's knowledge and man's knowledge. They knew what was going to happen because it happened in the past. They had come into knowledge of what happened in the past and were then simply watching a uh, recording of what happened in the past. So you're, gonna, you're actually going to parallel that with God. So God comes to find out what men are going to do. And that basically God's interaction with history is like God watching the DVR of the Atlanta Falcons in the Super Bowl. You really want to go there? That's not even Molinism. That's not, that's not, even, that's not even the Molinist. Even Molina had a much higher view of God's sovereignty and his knowledge than is presented in that. It w I, I'm... It's bad. Um, but you are stuck with a God who created... Now, th th and this is why I, Craig should have said, no, nope, not even close, because there's a Molinist that, that doesn't work. Nyeh, throw it out. But he didn't, so there you go. Um, but God created, and he creates all the possibilities of these things happening, and all the evil and everything else, but then he comes to know what's going to happen, just as you came to know what was going to happen in the Super Bowl, even though the reality had already taken place. And then you reduce history to mankind simply doing what God already has foreknowledge they're going to do, but it's something God learned. There's no sovereignty there. There's no reason whatsoever for God to be glorified. For any, because there's no interaction. See, you could not interact as you're watching the Super Bowl with what's going on, on the screen. You could not try to call the coach. It's too late. You can't reach that guy's cell phone to tell him what's going to happen in the future. You can't. God could not change anything. History and the future is a fixed reality, and it was not fixed by God's decree in any way, shape, or form. And so, it, you really want to make that a parallel. That, that's, wow, um, really, really, really bad. Um, no, that's not how God knows uh, future events. Okay, one more before we go to the, uh, the Drew, Drew Brees stuff here. Uh, yesterday, um, I think it was yesterday, maybe last night, maybe this morning, I don't know. Anyway, um, we have a tweet from Dr. David Allen um, that was linked to a, some article, yes, Jesus did die for the sins of everyone. Limited atonement remains a doctrine in search of a text. <laughs> um, when, when, we, when we finally have someone providing meaningful, in-depth, exegetical responses to all the texts we've presented, rather than just simply dodging them, Maybe we can take such claims seriously, but you can write hundreds of pages of obfuscation, but 
not actual serious interaction. And then the statement was made, there is no atonement text in Scripture stating that God intends to save only elect the elect. There is no atonement text in Scripture stating that God wills only the salvation of the elect. And so I rather cheekily uh, responded by referring to a number of texts. Uh, one, you know, and of course, immediately the anti-Calvinists, you know, come running onto the stage to wave their flags and, and do things like that. Um, that's just their, their, their thing. But the, the one I primarily focused upon was Romans chapter 8, once again, uh, because no matter how hard uh, the best of the other side try, you, you have to find a way to get around what is being said in the golden chain and in the law court that follows after the golden chain. Sometimes we skip that. Sometimes we don't see that. We, we should. We need to recognize that it's there because it's vitally important. Because after the golden chain of redemption, where God is the act actor, God is the one doing all of the actions himself. Uh, Paul says in verse 31 of Romans 8, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, the us has already been defined, but it's going to be de redefined in the context as well. Uh, the one who did not spare his own son, but in behalf of us, Hamon, the same Hamon that was in verse 31, if, if, so in verse 31, if God is huper hemon for us, tithkoth hemon, who can be against us, if God did not spare his own son but delivered him up, huper hemon, same phrase found in verse 31, but delivered him up for us all, And notice that the paradokan is paradidomi, the same term that's used in the Gospels, of, of the, uh, and I think Hebrews as well, of Jesus being given over. Um, and this is clearly, by the way, this is clearly an atonement text in the context of the elect. This fulfills everything that David Allen says isn't there. It's right there, right there. And the day that David Allen is willing to, to debate this text full on. Nothing but the Greek text of Romans 8, 28 through 38 is the day that I'm on a plane to Dallas to do it at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And he knows that. Dr. Allen, if you really believe this, let's do it. Let's debate this. There's some other guys that like to debate in Dallas. So... Dallas is a, is a target-rich environment, as has been said in the military lingo. But delivered him over for us all, that's substitutionary language, that's atonement language, in the context of election language. How shall he not, together with him, freely give karisatai? From, from which we get charis, graciously, gift, freely give us tapanta, all things. Who will bring a charge, legal terminology, will bring a charge against the elect of God? It doesn't get any plainer than this. Here you have election, the elect of God, the giving over of the Son. It's all right here. Who will bring a charge against the elect of God? How about who will bring a charge against anyone? Because Christ has died for everyone, right? See, Paul's operating on a completely different foundation than David Allen operates upon. David Allen's operating upon the foundation of the idea of possibility. And as Leighton Flowers puts it, probability. Making things possible. Paul's not operating on that reality. That's not what the golden chain is about. The golden chain puts everything in the past because it is in the past, in the sense of reality from God's perspective. It's a part of his decree. It cannot be destroyed. It cannot be undone. God will accomplish his purpose. So, who will bring a charge against the elect of God? God is the one justifying. 
Who is the one condemning? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Rather, who is raised, who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes, who per hemon. You can't split this stuff up. You've got who per hemon up in 31, 32. Now here it is in 34. It's tying all of it together. It's substitutionary. It's specific. It's about the elect. And it's about atonement. It's right there. I haven't had to make anything up. Just read through it. What does the one who is at the right hand of the Father do? He intercedes who per hemon. He is not interceding for every single human being. And Michael Brown and I have discussed this. I've, I've thrown this out to all these people. They don't have answers for that. They want to stay focused on, but yeah, but over here in 1 John 2, 2. No, let's, let's talk about what the high priest actually does when he's seated at the right hand of the Father. What does that intercession mean? Man, they don't want to go there for love nor money. Because if they have to say, well, he's interceding for everyone. They know what that means, and they know what the result of that will be. So they don't want to go there. They don't want to go there. So, uh, Dr. Allen, you keep throwing this stuff out there, and, p- and people are going to keep asking you, hey, if you're really so confident, James White has demonstrated over the course of 170 so far, moderated public debates, that number is going to go up a whole lot over the next couple of months, uh, rather radically fast. In fact, I was watching, I pulled up because Cy and I think his brother were chatting about um, now if, if we can just get uh, Jeff Durbin to have the right view of baptism. And my response was, don't worry, I think Jeff and I have that covered. And I, I went and I got the link to the debate with Bill Shishko. And so I dropped that in there, and Cy's like, ha, 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 you know. Because um, Cy was at Apologia on Sunday. He sat a few rows back behind me. And uh, Jeff hit out of the park. It was, it was great. But anyway, um, so I, I happened to turn on, because I wanted to watch the opening with Chris, where Chris, <laughs> when he was talking about, <laughs> when he was talking about Rich Jensen, yeah, yeah, what's this thing back here? Huh? That must be a kiddie pool. Yeah, uh-huh, right. Yeah, the baptistry back there. And, but then he was introducing Rich Jensen, and, and he, said, uh, he said he was the, uh, the youngest uh, Nassau County. Uh, well, he was the youngest. He's not now anymore. Uh, the youngest Nassau County uh, uh, detective. And then he said something like, and he was, he was involved with the Amityville horror murder case. He said, not as a participant. <laughs> and and uh, just uh, the camera happened to be on Rich when he said it. And he just about, just about fell out of his chair. I think you can see me too. And <laughs> it's just any time. And, and then, of course, when Rich gets up, he says, uh, he says uh, my job is to keep this debate going, not let it get stalled. And hence, in the pursuit of my job, one of my biggest jobs is to keep the microphone out of Chris Arnzen's hand. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, how to get on to that? Uh, oh, the uh, the uh, the baptism, the baptism thing. Um, uh, but the point was uh, when uh, when Chris introduced me, that was 2006. When Chris introduced me, he said I had done more than 50 moderated public debates. So in the past 13 years, 120 is nearly, that's like nine a year. That's ridiculous. As, as Clementine said, uh, I, was talk, I was on FaceTime with Clementine over the weekend, and she, she was asking me about what debates are, and I told her, and she said, you've done too many. And it's like, okay, well, I guess I'll have to retire, because Clementine said, I'm, I'm done. So anyways, the point is, Dr. Allen... <clears throat> You cannot make the argument um, that this would not be a scholarly, respectful, controlled, focused uh, debate, because it would be, and everybody knows it would be. And our argument is you cannot stand toe-to-toe in the Greek text. You, sir, wrote the numerical commentary on the book of Hebrews. So... 
you know, some people will say, well, you know, you've taught Greek over the years. I'm not going to do the blah, blah, blah. You have, I, I don't see what the excuse can be here. I really, really don't. We're both published authors. We've both taught for years in seminary. Uh, we both have credentials in Greek. Why not? Why not? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. All right. I'll close that one down there. There we go. So, uh, boy, Twitter is really quiet today. Um, all right. Let's, um, let's get to the important part. Well, not that any of that was not important. I'm not, don't, don't take me wrong there. I'm teaching a church history class tonight for, uh, Apologia. Um, we're going really slow. <laughs> this is... I'm going to be a part of history before we get very far into history uh, at the rate that we're going. But uh, that's okay. It's sort of fun just to sit there for two hours and sort of slowly go through. Uh, you know, we'll probably get to Ignatius this evening, maybe. We'll get, we may not even finish him up. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, <clears throat> one of the key issues to deal with when you're looking at the early church I, I think one of, the, one of the greatest weaknesses of modern evangelicals is that they don't know the early church. We don't talk about the early church. I, mean, I do, obviously, but we're weird. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, still relatively new to apology. I haven't even been there a year yet. That's coming up in a couple months. Um, but one of the things that I immediately started doing is want to introduce people to some of those early writers, and to get them used to the fact that they didn't look identical to us. They don't have to. But we can still learn from them, even if their context was different than ours, and their dress was different than ours, and their liturgy was different than ours. The issue is, what did they believe? What was, what was the core of the faith? And what did they have, especially in those first few centuries, in comparison to what we have? And what, how much more consistent should we be given how much we have, than th what they strove for, and they did strive for consistency, but didn't have nearly what you and I have. Anyway, because we don't know the early church, we don't know how the early church responded to persecution. And there are a lot of parallels, a lot of parallels, between the worldview that is being embraced by our culture, and the worldview of the Roman Empire. The totalitarian state, and of course Rome could never have even dreamed of the kind of totalitarianism that China is producing today. Could never have dreamed of it. Even Orwell couldn't dream of uh, the kind of technological advancement that unfortunately we possess today, which can be used for good and can be used greatly for evil, as it's being greatly used for evil in China today, to enforce godless behavior and things like that. So, um, Rich, I'm going to put this up, but what you need to do is you need to uh, zoom in on it and take the bottom stuff out if you can. I don't want this entire episode to get kicked by YouTube just because these people hate God and they would go after us on YouTube no matter how fair use it was. We'd have to fight it. So try to zoom in on it and uh, that way we can, we can, yeah, I'm just going to start from right there and that, yep, there. I'm going to start from right there. Not, not, not the... Yeah, just, just, even if it's a little goofy looking... I got the video, and I was going to talk about the people that were talking about the video, who are God-hating, well-known people, but they hate God. Uh, but then I realized, you know what, I don't want to go through the fight of, we'd win, eventually. Yeah, that looks good. We'd win eventually, but I just don't want to have to fight it. So that's, that's a good idea, I think, on our, on our part. Anyway, back to early church. The point is that we are facing without, we, we face 
technological aspects the early church didn't face, but when it comes to the worldview, the Roman Empire wanted to help everyone to get along. Let's all just get along. They had to do that because they had subjugated so many different people groups that their energy would be sapped if they were constantly having to use their major resources to put down little mini rebellions here and rebellions there and so on and so forth. So let's all get along. And so they offered bread and circuses. They offered economic peace and prosperity, which did last for literally hundreds of years. It's a Pax Romana, which I think was part of God's plan, of course, that's when the gospel goes out, and that's, you know, people can travel, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> anyway, um, and the price of this was that you could still continue to worship your ancestral gods, the gods of your peoples, but you, 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 you need to be inclusive. You need to be inclusive. These exclusive claims, that's what causes division. So we, we don't want exclusivity, we want inclusivity, see? And so what you had to do, eventually what was established in the empire was that you needed to offer a pinch of incense upon an altar. It was just a little thing, but it was done publicly. And you take the incense and you throw it in the flames and, you know, incense does what incense does. You could smell it. And when you did that, you were to say, Kaiser Kurios, Caesar is Lord. Kaiser Kurios, Caesar is Lord. Well, the Jews had already worked out a deal, in essence, with Rome to where they didn't have to do that. And at first... As we see in the New Testament, the, the, Jew, the Romans just viewed Christianity as a Jewish sect. And it was about halfway through the first century that the Romans started figuring out, uh, no, the, the, our household slaves are converting to this thing, so, and they're not Jews, so we can stop treating these Christians uh, as Jews, and so they don't have... And that's one of the reasons the Jews were so angry, is that the Romans were thinking about taking away their privileges because of these whacked out Christians. Um, and so they come to the conclusion that we can persecute the Christians because we don't, really don't have an agreement with them. They're a, they're a cult in of themselves. They're followers of Crestus. And so they have to offer the incense. And the Christians go, we can't. Because they've already said, Jesus Kurios, Jesus is Lord. That's exactly the, the language that Paul uses when he writes to the Corinthians. No one, no one can say Jesus Kurios except by the Holy Spirit. Down through all of church history, you could argue that Christians in every generation have had to face the question, what in my day is the parallel, the correlative to what the early church faced in offering incense upon the altar. Because, see, they struggled with it. They struggled mightily with it. And, in fact, um, their the early church writers would identify three different groups. The sacrificati, uh, the Libelatici, and the Traditors. And they sort of in that, that's how bad that was, was in that, in that row. Sacrificati were people who offered sacrifice. So if you offered sacrifice to Caesar, you've just denied Christ. And the majority opinion of almost all Christian leaders was, you do that, you're gone. That's the... That's the, that's the same thing as when the Jews would go back to the temple and offer sacrifice in the Jewish temple, in their mind. The Libelatici were people who got the Libelus. The Libelus was a document that said that you had offered sacrifice, but you could sort of, under the table, buy those so you could do commerce. You could sell, buy and sell. It was part of your documents. You know, give me your documents. You know, that type of thing. Um, 
without having actually done it. And then you had the Traditors. The Traditors were people who had given up the Christian scriptures. But there were different levels of them, too, because there were people who, realizing that Roman soldiers weren't necessarily the most educated people on the planet, especially at that point in Roman history, maybe a few hundred years earlier they had been a little bit more, but you could give them almost any literature, and they're not going to know whether it was the scriptures or not. They don't know what the content of the scriptures is. And so there are different levels. You may have given up the scriptures. You may have given up something that looked like the scriptures. But you were a traditor if you gave the Romans anything at all. So these are different levels. Sacrificati, top level. Libelatici, you're, you're paying money to make it look like you've done the other ones. So, and then traditors, you either did or did not give up the scriptures. And so when you'd have persecution come through an area, sometimes it would last for five, ten years, and it stops frequently associated with a particular Roman procurator or something in your area that didn't like Christians, and the next one doesn't care, and so it ebbs and flows. Of course, from about 250 to 313, it's constant. But anyway, uh, when persecution ends, then the church has to deal with, what do we do with people who come back and they want to be a part of the fellowship? But they did any one of these things. And the church was torn apart by how to deal with the issue of apostasy. Would the church today even give it a second thought is the question we might have. Would any of these categories even have meaning for us today? What might some of them be? How is Caesar demanding your offering of incense today? Well, I think one illustration came out recently in the Drew Brees controversy. Drew has a, a testimony of faith in Christ, and he, by, by the way, is a fantastic quarterback. No one can argue that one. I mean, just his longevity in the league I mean, anybody who can, you know, when you look at people who last as long as Roethlisberger and Drew Brees and, you know, you know, I know everybody hates some of these guys because they're on the other team, whatever it might be. But man, I don't, I wouldn't last very long with 300 pound linemen landing on top of me, you know, three or four times each weekend. Um, you, you've got to. You got got to really be an expert at rehab, <laughs> basically. Uh, I mean, Tom Brady, yeah, expert at rehab uh, is is what these guys really are, and who knows what they're going to look like thirty years from now. Uh, that's really one of the questions that's coming up these days. Is you make a lot of money in your first thirty years, and then the next thirty years you live in pain and die an early death. Is it really worth it? Some of the questions. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Let, please let let do do not do not bury poor Rich under the phone phone calls with arguments. You'll argue football. Okay, he's a Washington Redskins fan. Go at it. Now go at it. I mean, that's pretty easy to go at these days. That's all I can say. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, what was I talking about? So Moses was in the bull rushes. No, Drew Brees recorded an absolutely innocuous video. I mean, <laughs> for bring your Bible to school week. But there was a catch. So let's look at what he said first, okay? So here is Drew Brees, and here's his, here, here's his video. Hey guys, Drew Brees here. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we live by faith, not by sight. So I want to encourage you to live out your faith on Bring Your Bible to School Day and share God's love with friends. You're not alone. Okay, I stopped it in time. So we won't have, we, the people that were putting this up can't <clears throat> yell and scream. Wow, he quoted we walk by faith and not by sight. Bring your Bible to school. Wow, what a horrible thing to do. Well, that obviously wasn't what made it horrible. 
What made it horrible, of course, was that it was for Focus on the Family. And Focus on the Family is a hate group. And why is it a hate group? It's a hate group because it has biblical morality. It does not believe that the LGBTQ lifestyle is the epitome of morality. It is, it is what must be celebrated by any enlightened culture. And that is what our culture demands today. Especially if you're going to get paid the big bucks throwing the pigskin around in the NFL or Major League Baseball or the NBA or NHL or whatever else. All of the major sports are completely any major corporation is ab, has it lives having to pay ransom constantly to the LGBTQ lobby. They own it all. You must celebrate us. We are the greatest thing that has ever happened to you. They demand it. And I can I can go back in the archives about as far back as the archives go. And I'm one person that has been saying for decades, homosexuals do not want equal rights. They want uber rights. They want to force us to celebrate. And there's one thing, <clears throat> unquestionably, um, right and wish I wasn't, but right on the nose and have been long before Certain people even knew what a teleprompter was. Just mentioned that in passing. So, anyway, because of who the video was for, not, not because of what was said, not because of its meaning, but because of the fact that this group does not bow to the God of Caesar. Focus on the family will not offer the pinch of incense. Neither do we. But if you don't offer the pinch of incense, you cannot buy or sell. You need to have the Libelus. The Libelus is a little rainbow flag today. That's a Libelus. That's why uh, when certain people like Joshua Harris leave the faith, What's he doing within a couple weeks of announcing he's leaving the faith? He's waving his Libelus around. He's got his, what was it? A, a rainbow donut. A rainbow donut. And a little rainbow shirt. That's his, that's his Libelus. He's saying, I've offered the pinch of incense to Caesar. I'm with you now. And that's what's demanded of anyone in the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, uh, uh, soccer, football as it's proper, properly known, whatever. <clears throat> That's what's going on outside the United States. I think next week. I'm actually excited about this. I'm actually excited about this. Some people in our audience are going to faint here. But there is a huge sporting event coming up next week. Now, right now... Uh, the, the Volta a España is going on, and that's exciting for me, but that's the last of the Grand Tours. And um, uh, Primoz Roglic is leading right now. Way to go. Uh, Pojacar is doing well. Anyways, that's not here than there. But at least in those sports, you, it's not quite as... It, in cycling, it really hasn't gotten that bad. Um, but the World Cup of Rugby is taking place in Japan starting next week. And I was just in South Africa. That's what everybody's talking about because the Springboks um, are looking really good right now. But Australia, New Zealand, and New Zealand, the All Blacks, who have dominated for a number of years, but Springboks have spanked them recently. So that's why it's going to be interesting. But the All Blacks from New Zealand, they even had jerseys made because their jerseys are black. Shocking. The All Blacks. Um... But when they would, when you would stretch it one way or another, the fabric is such that it turns into a rainbow. Yeah, even even rugby, which 
is not it's 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 a really gendered sport. <laughs> That's just all there is to it. I mean, I mean, when you think of rugby, you think of big sweaty guys running into other big sweaty guys, and unlike American football, they ain't wearing pads, uh, which is one of the reasons they don't get injured as often. Believe it or not, seriously, um, they don't. Um, but anyhow, that's neither here nor there. The point is, it doesn't matter anywhere you go. You've got to, where's your Libelus? Where, where, have you been to a Pride March recently? Where's your, where are your tweets? See, we, we, talk, we, we talk about virtue signaling, identity signaling. That's the Libelus. This is, there's nothing new here. You've offered the pinch of incense. You've been given the Libelus. Now you can buy and sell and trade. So we have to start thinking as Christians when our jobs, schools, and culture says to us, you need to virtue signal. You need to wave your Libelus around. But first you have to offer the pinch of incense. What does that involve? Now, the danger is, if I come to the conclusion, I can't do that, then I need to, ex this needs to be done within the church, it's sort of, sort of a church thing, but what happened in the early church was there were certain people who were martyred, or who were beaten, or who were imprisoned, or who were disfigured, and then when the persecution would stop, they'd come back in to the church, and divisions would take place because there were other people that felt they went too far. And so there are all sorts of, I mean, it was the single, I mean, Gnosticism was the greatest external thing, but internally it was how to deal with, with persecution, caused the most division. And so it's really easy for you to go, well, I don't think you should do any of that stuff, and I'm going to stand firm. Yeah, well, once they're knocking on your door and dragging you off prison, and leaving your wife alone, uh, then we'll, we'll see. It's real easy to talk about how brave we're going to be. If you're sitting here and thinking anything other than, oh God, only by your grace, then you're a fool. Because the only way that anyone ever survives is by God's grace. Okay? Just keep that in mind. Um, so there's never, ever a, a basis for boasting against somebody else but unfortunately, that's frequently what ends up happening. So what happens to Drew Brees? Well, Drew Brees has to just mea culpa himself out of existence for having dared to do that. Now, what would I have liked to see him do? I would have liked to see him go, look at what I said. Is there something wrong with the verse? And if you're going to go after focus on the family then tell me, but see, he's already seen what's happened to the, the, the guy down in Australia who got kicked out of football down there. It's football, or was it rugby? I forget which one it was. Anyways, unfortunately, I think his name is Falau, or Palau, one of the two, but he's unfortunately not an Orthodox Christian. He's not a Trinitarian. Um, but he's got a lawsuit going because he was kicked out because he quoted from the Bible about homosexuality. Um, and it would have been nice for someone to go, Hey, um, what, what did I say that was wrong? And what is wrong in affirming natural marriage, so on and so forth? Can't do that in the NFL. Can't do that in the NFL. Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, soccer. Okay, that's football. That's football. No, it's football. Down there is football. We have a global audience, son. We need, to, we need to recognize that they, we need to speak the language of the rest of the world. <laughs> so let's take let's uh, uh, well, they don't call it soccer down there. Uh, so let's uh, let's 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 listen to what Drew Brees did, and we can you can go full screen on this because there's nothing. No one's gonna. Well, I hope no one's gonna try to bonk us for this one. But here's what uh, what Drew Brees had to say. Hello, everyone. There's been a lot of negativity spread about me in the LGBTQ community. Um, recently based upon a article that someone wrote with a very negative headline that um, I think led people to believe that somehow I was aligned with an organization that was uh, anti-LGBTQ um, and, and so on and so forth. 
um, I'd like to set the record straight. Um, I live by two very simple Christian fundamentals, and that is love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. I think the first one is very self-explanatory. The second one, love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean to me? That means love all, respect all, and accept all. So that is actually how I live my life. That is what I try to do with my family, with my teammates, with uh, people in my community, with my friends, all people. No matter your race, your color, your religious preference, your uh, sexual orientation, um, your political beliefs, it doesn't matter. So the fact that these rumors um, have been spread about me are completely untrue. What I did was I filmed a video recently um, that was encouraging kids to bring their Bibles to school for National Bring Your Bible to School Day. To bring your Bibles to school, to be able to live out your faith with confidence, and I even gave one of my favorite Bible verses. It was as simple as that. So I'm not sure why the negativity spread or why people tried to rope me into certain negativity. I do not support any groups that discriminate um, or that have their own uh, agendas that are trying to um, uh, promote inequality, okay? So hopefully that has set the record straight uh, and we can all move on because that's not what I stand for. Uh, have a great day. Okay. So we all know why um, he had to do that. Um, but we need to think about what was said from a Christian perspective. And we need to pray for Drew Brees. Um, if he's a true believer, then we pray that he will come to a deeper understanding of certain things. Um, but let's, let, let's put it in a small box and let's let's listen to it again and uh, uh, look at some of the some of the specifics. Hello, everyone. There's been a lot of negativity spread about me in the LGBTQ community um, recently, based upon a article that someone wrote with a very negative headline that um, I think led people to believe that somehow I was aligned with an organization that. Okay, if you looked, because um, I did tweet this earlier. If you looked at the comments to Drew Brees' tweet, vile, but fully expected. Basically, many of the comments said, focus on the family, hate group, you knew. The, the idea is you cannot have anything to do. These people are totalitarians. There is no freedom of association. Uh, there is no place in this society from their perspective for anyone who has any views other than their own. They are closed-minded. They are the very picture of exclusivity, bigots, prejudice, hatred, and all in the service of inclusivity and love. It's just it, that, but we all know that. We see that in what's going on in our society today. They, they, they live in an echo chamber. All they hear is one thing and focus on the family. Since focus on the family is pro-biblical family, then it cannot be pro-LGBTQ, I-S-T-R, whatever. Um, and so since it was posted by them or recorded by them or they have something to do with the promotion, I, I don't know what the association was, but that's where it's coming from, and that is not allowed in a totalitarian mental state, which is what we're dealing with today. It was uh, anti-LGBTQ um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I'd like to set the record straight. Um, I live by two very simple Christian fundamentals. Okay, these are two good fundamentals, but let's talk about what they mean. That is, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. I think the first one is very self-explanatory. Yeah, not really. Uh, is it really self-explanatory? This is the key issue today. Because if you love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then you're going to love what he loves and hate what he hates. Not what the society tells you to. And here's where you have the problem of God's law. And here's where a lot of Christians and a lot of Christian churches have a fatal blind spot. And that is, oh, I love God, but 
I just will not accept the idea that his law reveals to us what is pleasing to him. If you love somebody, then you're going to want to love what they love. If you want to be pleasing in their sight, then you want to know what hurts them or what, what is offensive to them, what they love. If you don't know the things that your wife likes or doesn't like, I mean, my wife, if she's going to take me out to celebrate something, if we're going to go out for my birthday, if we're going to go out for my 175th debate or something like that to celebrate that, she's not going to take me to a Chinese restaurant because she knows I detest Chinese food. I detest all, all Asian food. It smells great. I just can't eat it. So if she takes me to such a place, then I'm going to be like offended because I know that she already knows that. Not that she's just ignorant of who I am. So we have this problem, and that is we've come up with this idea that we can love God, but we can then just ignore what he says he loves. He loves his law. His law represents who he is. He loves justice, but his law defines what justice is. We don't get to define that. That's one of the problems we have today, is we're letting the society define justice rather than God's Word defining justice. And so, it's not self-explanatory. If we love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that means the entirety of our life is going to be under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That means our worldview and what we do and do not approve and what we do and do not celebrate or accept will be defined by God's law, not by society. That's where the real issue here is. The second one, love your neighbors yourself. What does that mean to me? That means... Well, um, first, what did it mean to Jesus? <laughs> not what it means to you. What it means to you should reflect serious study of what it meant to Jesus. You, you, we don't get to change this stuff, okay? And so if you love your neighbor as yourself, you do good to them in light of God's revelation of what good is. So the good Samaritan showed God's love by taking care of the man's actual needs, not what society would have said one way or the other. So it's, it's not so simple. We don't get to define this. We have to do this in light of God's law all, respect all, and accept all. Okay, love all, respect all, accept all. What does that mean? What do you mean respect all? I do not respect thieves. I do not respect drug abusers. Um, I do not respect murderers. I do not respect pedophiles. Um, so what do you mean by respect? I do not respect homosexuality. I recognize a homosexual is made in the image of God, and that's why I will call them to repentance so that they can experience God's best for their life. That's how you show love for them. But you do not accept that kind of thing. This is, this is, this is why the church has no impact any longer, quite honestly, is because we've accepted the world's definition of what acceptance is. Acceptance doesn't mean that, that I'm... In, in our culture, I'm not going to go and, and try to um, stop people from doing bad things in that realm, but I'm going to call them to repentance. So I cannot accept that what they're doing is good. And see, that's what Rome wanted everybody to do. See, when Rome, when Rome said, acknowledge Caesar, say Caesar is Lord, they weren't saying you have to not accept your own gods, just accept him along with. So what our society is saying is, you need to accept the authority of what Caesar is saying is good. You can still believe what you want to believe, but Caesar gets to have the final word. And you need to, it's a syncretism. You know, you can join your Jesusness to the society, which means you keep your Jesusness to yourself. And you change the definition of loving someone from telling them the truth to acceptance, which is silence.
Let them go on in their rebellion. That's that's basically. Um, <laughs> I just looked over at Twitter. Um, I just lost. I just lost. I, I, I guess I'm going to be blocked by Kofi from now on. But yeah, what can I say? So that is actually how I live my life. That is what I try to do with my family. I can guarantee you, you do not do with your family what the society is demanding you do in regards to LGBTQ people. You love your wife and your children too much to treat them the way the society is saying, you need to accept what we say in these areas. You tr I hope you're training up your children to know what's right. I hope you're training up your children to recognize that you, the relationship with your wife is exclusively good in God's sight and that it's good for a man to love a woman, but not to love another man. If you're not, you're, you're not, how, how can you walk through Matthew chapter 19 with your children as a Christian? That's a question. With my teammates, with uh, people in my community, with my friends, all people, no matter your race, your color, your religious preference, your... Uh... Okay, it's not a religious preference. That's, that's, that's where the world comes in as well and says religious preference. Uh, that's a good pluralistic word. That's a, again, that's, that's how Caesar wants us to understand things. But it's not preference. It's not like we are these autonomous gods who get to go, oh, I think I'll do this religion, I'll do that religion, and so on and so forth. Um, as a Christian, why, do we, why are we using language like this? I, and then the next one. Orientation. Sexual orientation. Sexual orientation. Who defines that? The society has demanded, this is, this is where the society goes, it doesn't matter what your previous religion believes. Caesar says, you will believe this. And the question for every Christian in this audience, you talked, you, when you were at church yesterday, did you sing some songs about bowing the knee to Jesus? About the lordship of Jesus? What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean right now with you at work? What does that mean right now if you're going to be going to work later in the day? Or tomorrow? What's that going to mean when the society demands that your attitude line up with their expectations? Especially when that means a denial of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Who said, from the beginning, male, female, father, mother, joined together, Children, when the world says, you need to celebrate two men, three men, five men, what does it matter? You need to celebrate that. You can't celebrate that. That's one of the sins Jesus died for. You don't celebrate the things that Jesus died for. Where do you draw the line? Your political beliefs, it doesn't matter. So the fact that these rumors um, have been spread about me are completely untrue. What I did was I filmed a video recently um, that was encouraging kids to bring their Bibles to school for National Bring Your Bible to School Day. To bring your Bibles to school, to be able to live out your faith with confidence, and I even gave one of my favorite Bibles. And by the way, that's one of the problems. I mean, as innocuous as that video was, the public school system is the holy of holies of the culture of death today. They want your children. They don't want the Bible in there. They don't want the people reading the Bible. Uh, that's going to cause cognitive dissonance. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you got to realize these, these people don't want the Bible in the public schools. It was as simple as that. So I'm not sure why the negativity spread or why people tried to rope me into well, certain you know, negativity. Well, you know. I do not support any groups that discriminate. Okay, what does it mean to discriminate? Um, you, you don't support any groups that discriminate. But you do want New Orleans fans. You do realize what New Orleans fans are. They're a big group of discriminators. Because if there's no discrimination, then they just cheer equally for every team. <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, the, the football stadium bleachers will all be one color. And... All the teams will run down the field congratulating each other all the time, and <laughs> it's not how it works. 
Uh, I discriminate against Asian food. That's discrimination. It is. I'm making a choice. That's all discrimination is. We have, we have so, there are so many words today that we have decided to redefine. So we've, we've come up with one meaning, the new meaning, but then we play on the old meaning. So racism, homophobia, misogyny, they're all used constantly today to have one meaning. And they play on the old meaning that those are immoral things, even though the new meaning has nothing to do with the old, old meanings at all. And so when it comes to discrimination, it has a meaning, but we've given it a new meaning. It simply means to choose, make choices, and we all make choices. And the LGBTQI community, whatever that is, discriminates against any Christian who holds to Jesus' teaching about marriage and sexuality. The comments on his tweet show that they do so hatefully and with bigotry and evil. Just go read them. I couldn't even read them on the air. Well, I could because we're not technically on the air. You can put anything on YouTube, but anyway. Um, or that have their own uh, agendas that are trying to um, uh, promote inequality. Inequality. Um, well, that would be me. Because, the, again, think through the worldview issues here, because I, I don't think that Brother Breeze has. Do you want equality for sinful Human destroying behaviors in our society. Is that, is that, you want equality for that? So if we oppose pedophilia, we oppose equality for pedophiles. So that's bad. That's coming. Don't sit there and say you don't know it's coming. It's coming. Ten years from now, it's going to be the same thing as transgenderism and homosexuality. You know it. You know it. So are you going to be for equality then? We don't, e equality of outcome has always been stupid, and it's especially stupid for a football player. You don't want equality of outcome. You want your side to win. That's what the game's all about. Equality of outcome is ridiculous. Equality of opportunity? Hey, everybody should have, hey, if, if you've got the skills, great. Shouldn't matter what your, what your race is if you've got the skills. But outcome? You haven't lived that way. Don't let the world force you to do it now. Okay. So hopefully that has set the record straight uh, and we can all move on because that's not what I stand for. Yeah. Well, uh, I couldn't live in the, in the situation he's in. No question about it. Uh, that would be beyond me. Um, that's why I'm not a professional athlete. <laughs> it never could be. Um, but we have to think through what we're saying and we can't simply parrot the language of the culture around us. Um, so there you go. Every one of us, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what, I suppose if you're a farmer out in the middle of nowhere, rural as you can get, you might be able to sort of push some of this stuff off. But if you don't think that they aren't going to come for you eventually, they will. They will. Uh, it's it's going to happen. And we can learn a lot from what the Christians did in the past and the mistakes they made in the past if we study church history. So anyway, all right, there you go. We uh, managed, I think, to get through all of it. That was, uh, <coughs> that was a bunch of stuff. That was a bunch of stuff. Went almost full jumbo length. So that'll keep some of you going uh, who have long trips to do and things like that. Uh, please, uh, once again, if you have noticed, the travel schedule this fall is ridiculously heavy. Uh, literally days, sometimes a week between major trips. And so that travel fund is getting taxed. Not taxed, but you know what I mean. The other words, use of the word taxed. Um, greatly uh, this fall. Uh, to get me to the places I need to go. Um, we are 
really looking forward to the debate that Michael Brown and I are going to be doing um, in London. Uh, that comes very shortly after uh, getting back from Australia, uh, the debate that Abdullah Kunda and I are doing there, uh, the trip up to Salt Lake City, um, just going, going, going. Then I'm going to St. Charles uh, the first full weekend in, um, I think it's the first full weekend in December. Uh, it's not the weekend af- right after Thanksgiving. It's the next one, I think 7, 8, 9, somewhere around there. We'll be in St. Charles again, as we have for this would be, I think, 18 years now. Uh, I just feel sorry for those folks, but they keep having me back. So, hey, you know, whatever. Uh, (laughs) But uh, so we've got a whole lot going on there. And don't forget, uh, bucket list, bucket list trip, uh, end of September, into October of 2020. Israel, seeing those places, but Mars Hill, Athens, Ephesus, it's going to be incredible. See the, uh, see the banner ad at uh, aomen.org for details on that. Lord willing, we'll see you. Um, you could be in tomorrow? Oh. Can't Thursday. No. Nope. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see you sometime. <laughs> Here on the dividing line. God bless.